Happy Father's Day and welcome to the Church at the Beach. We look forward today to worshiping with you and we're so glad you could be a part of us here at the Church at the Beach. Before he spoke creation, the God of heaven knew His reflection, we are His glory on display, and His heart is good, He is always kind, with the cross He proved, He is on
What a fitting song to begin our message today on Father's Day about sons and daughters of God. Each of us have fathers and mothers, and we're so thankful today to be able to celebrate Father's Day. If you would, find a copy of Scripture and turn with me to the book of James, chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. Our title for the message today is a call to listen and act. If you would, read together with me as we go to verse 19 in James chapter 1. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Now, this is not, of course, to say that anger is bad or good. It's just there are good kinds of anger and bad kinds of anger. And the kind that is undesirable does not put forth the righteousness of God. Verse 21, he says, Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted. It's almost like putting a seed in the ground, planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. In fact, if you listen and you don't act, James is saying you are self-deceived. Do, he says, what it says. Do what it says. Verse 23, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Now, we have to remember that a mirror in first century is not like the mirror you have in your house and I have in mine. It's some kind of a very shiny, high-polished metal or alloy. And so it's not perfect, but you can see enough that you can tell if something is right or wrong. And so you don't just look in the mirror and see something that's wrong and walk away and forget it and don't do anything about it. He reveals himself in proclamation and in preaching to the hearts and minds of people. And so he's talking about the perfect law that gives freedom. And he says, continue in that, not forgetting what you have heard, but doing it. They will be blessed, James says. They will be blessed for what they do. Verse 26 those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues. Now, remembering that it's out of the heart that the mouth speaks. And so he's also not only speaking of what that organ in our mouth is, that muscle in our mouth, the tongue, but he's talking about what it displays from the heart. He says that we are to keep rein on our tongues unless we deceive ourselves with that. And their religion, if they do become deceptive with their tongue, is worthless. In other words, if you don't speak and act from the heart in truth with what you believe, then what you believe becomes a sham and it's worthless. Now he goes back and he uses the word as a noun in verse 27. He says religion, not the kind most of us think about, not ceremonies and action, but real God sensed and lived religion, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and, and faith faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows or those that are oppressed and dispossessed, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Would you pray with me? Father, today we want to pray for those in our church that are sick and in need of healing and those who have losses. We pray for Charles Brown who's having some terrible issues with pain throughout his body. And uh, his wife, Sam, has called and asked us to be in special prayer for him. And we do that today. We pray for Saul Williams, but uh, some praise in that prayer today. Uh, he ceases cancer beginning to be diminished and he actually was able to come by the church today. And Father, we thank you that we could visit with him and hear these good words from him. For Jerry Dodd, who's in Georgia struggling with cancer. For Violet, the three-year-old that we're praying for, for faith as she continues in this high-risk pregnancy and only days away from being able to have that child birthed. 
And then, Father, we pray for Topper Rush and his friend. We pray for Rob Smith and his friend. And, Father, we certainly continue to pray for our nation in the anarchy and, and in the con confusion that's out there. Lord, we just ask that you would help us to be people of one nation under God and be people that are under the rule of law and under those who are put in authority over us as the scripture calls us to. And then today, we close by praying for our fathers. We thank you for them and their being part of us being here and their influence in our life. But Father, I always know that when I pray about fathers that there are those who have bad experiences with fathers. And I pray, Father, for healing uh, and uh, for forgiveness for those. And, and so, Lord, as we come together, help us to realize that when we celebrate Father's Day, we do it through the ideal of our Heavenly Father, who is a divine and perfect both giver and protector of all of us. Father, pray for our leaders. We ask as we pray for our leaders that you would continue to give them wisdom in these days. We pray for our churches as we begin to regather. We pray, Father, for uh, the love of Christ to be shown as we go through awkward things that give awkward moments and services. Father, for those who are particularly at risk in this virus that's out there in the COVID-19, and Father, that it would continue to diminish and its effect on our nation would continue to be less and less. And Father, for those who have seen unemployment, uh, we pray that they would continue to see your provision in their life. And we thank you, Lord, for uh, all the numbers we see beginning to rise and employment beginning to go back up and recovery starting to take place in our nation. We give you praise for that. We ask all of this in and through the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, we'll be looking at a call to listen and act. In the first half of the book of James, we were encouraged to do three things, three ways to behave. One, we were challenged about trials. Then we were cautioned about how we deal with temptations. And finally, there was a clarification of what good and perfect gifts really matter, only those that come from God. But after this, we move to the next section as we begin over in verse 19 in our text, and we realize that there are here again Three things we need to pay attention to. In fact, three ways that the Word needs to be used. Now, by Word, I mean God's Word. I mean the Gospel. And so the first one is to receive God's Word. And the second is to practice God's Word. And the third is to share God's Word. In fact, this is where it moves from the heart to the behavior of the individual. In fact, I'm reminded of how this heart issue affects a believer as they first come to know Christ. In the book of Acts, there is a story that takes place in the town of Samaria. Philip has gone there to preach, and Peter and John come up to meet him, and while they're there, they meet a sorcerer whose name is Simon. And Simon readily catches on to the ministry. He has been one who has captivated the audience of that area and now the gospel has taken its place. He begins to follow them. He comes to know Christ, the scripture says, and makes him his Lord and Savior. At least that's verbal testimony. And then when he sees them place their hands on folks and they receive the Holy Spirit, he wants to purchase the ability to do that from the disciples. Well, they're upset about that. In fact, in verse 22, Peter says to him, Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in hope that he may forgive you for having such thoughts in your heart. Now, he's saying the same thing Peter is here to Simon as James is saying to us in the text today, that it's a matter of the heart. He says, Repent of that for having such thoughts in your heart. And then in verse 23, he says, For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Well, if you come over to our text today and we look in verse 19, he says, Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. And then once he gets past that in verse 21, he says, Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil. 
Well, here you have the same thing causing the issues with Simon as James sees as causing the issue with those people in the dispersion to whom he is writing. And he says, so prevent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Only God in his truthful word has the ability to save us from the evil and corruption and yes, bitterness. It's such a problem. Anger that leads to bitterness and grows a root is such a problem in the lives of believers. And so he's encouraging us to change that. Well, the first thing he says, you have to look at your conduct. When we receive the Word of God, we've got to look at our conduct. Now, this Word is planted. And if you are the audience of the first century, one of the most famous stories about Jesus where he preaches the story of the sower that went forth to sow. And in fact, that seed is planted. It's the same word as the word here in the text. And I want to go there. It's in uh, Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. And there we have the sower goes forth to sow. And some of it falls on the hard ground. Some of it falls on stony ground. Some of it falls on ground that is full of weeds. And other founds falls on fertile soil. And it produces greatly. Well, sometimes when our conduct as Christians is not what it ought to be, uh, it's just all around us. We don't really have anything to do with it. And that's what the seed is on the hard ground. It's fall, it fell all around us, and it says that the birds came down and took it real quickly. And it never had a chance to actually take root. And sometimes in our life, we don't pay enough attention to what's going on with the truth of God to really ever let it even begin to affect us. But then there are others who see it, and they try to showcase it. They're not just around it, they're trying to showcase it. In fact, they take it in and they're so energetic and they're so on fire, almost like the warmth of soil, that stuff springs up. But as soon as the sun comes out, because it has no depth and it has no connection to what will keep it strong, it dries up. But then there's a third kind, the kind that is incorporated and we're incorporated in it, and I mean by that is that the Word comes, we bring it into our lives, and what we try to do is we try to live with one foot in the kingdom of God and one foot in the world. And Jesus said that won't work either. None of those will work as proper conduct. The only proper conduct that will work is for the conduct that is real and it takes root and fertile soil and it begins to grow and our conduct begins to be directly effective to our character. Directly effective on our character. It's not what we do, it's who we are. That's what takes place. Who we are. Now, as we listen and as we seek to really hear from God and allow what we hear from God to begin to change our heart that in turn changes our action then our character is such that when we live in the world, other people see us and they know that there's a difference. I'm reminded of Jesus in his teaching of the final judgment. In fact, if we go and look at that passage in the 25th chapter of Matthew, we find these words. He's already spoken to those who are on his right side. And it's interesting that all the things of those people on the right side that they're doing that show for a fact that they belong to him are unnoticeable to them. But notice about those who are on the other side. In fact, sometimes we call them the goats. In verse 41, he says, Then he will say to those on his left side, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for you and prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you didn't give me anything to eat. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me anything to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. And they will answer the Lord, When did we see you in all these ways, and not do this? And as much as you've not done it unto the least of these, Jesus said, You haven't done it unto me. And so the whole picture here is they thought they were doing it, but they weren't. 
In fact, one scripture says that there are those on judgment day that God's going to come to and he's going to say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. Well, we did this in your name, Lord, and we did that in your name. And they claim all the things that they did in the name of the Lord, but they're more like those first couple of words. It's just around them. They're just showcasing it. They've let it be incorporated into their life, but it's never really been planted and taken root. And so as a result, what we need to do first, James says, is we need to receive the word and let it be grafted into our heart and let it change us. Now we can see how that happened in two of the disciples' lives. We have the disciple Peter on the one hand, who is called Rock. In fact, that's what his name means. And he says, you are like faith. You're a little expression of faith, like the faith that will build the kingdom. And of course, at the end of his life, you have this man and one other man in direct response to Jesus doing things that are less than appropriate. We find Peter denying our Lord three times and he goes out and he weeps because he knew that what Jesus said at the supper that he would deny him three times before the rooster would crow that morning and he had done that. He was so ashamed and so hurt by his behavior he went out and he wept bitterly. But there was another person. You remember his name was Judas. But the scripture says that Judas didn't repent. It said he was remorseful and he went out and he hung himself. See, two completely different actions, though both of them were sinful in their behavior, but because of what was really either in their heart or not in their heart, in the heart of Peter, really there, not in the heart of Judas, their action and their response in their life was totally different. So the first thing we need to do, if we're going to be people called to listen and act, we need to receive the Word of God. We need to be saved. We need to have Jesus truly living in our heart in such a way that it's not only what we do, but because of that transformation by the Holy Spirit, who we are and who we're becoming. Character. Do you have that in your life and does it show in the world in which you live? Our second point today is practice the word. Once we've received the word, God calls on us out of our heart, if we're going to be true and do what the word says, to practice its truths. One of the greatest examples of this is found in Mark's gospel, chapter 12, verse 41 through 44. Notice the widow and the mites and what Jesus has to say about this. the truth. I say unto you that this poor widow I cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God, but she of her penury has cast in all the living that she had. When we practice the word, James says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Certainly, the widow was doing what it says. In fact, you may say, well, how do I know when I am and am not doing it? Well, he uses a picture of, uh, of a mirror that we look at a mirror and the mirror exposes to us what's on our face. I don't know if you've ever been out to eat or somewhere like that and you've been in conversation and you got up to go to the restroom and, and you washed your hands and you looked up and you had food or something on your face and you went, oh my goodness, how did that happen? Well, the mirror serves the same purpose in the lesson today. It shows us where things are wrong when we look at it. And so as we look up, how do we become convicted about what's wrong in our life? In fact, if you go with me to the book of Hebrews, and I, I do want to go there for just a moment, 
and read this to you. It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. In other words, God, if you belong to Him, is going to discipline you. And by the way, I always like to share with folks, if God is disciplining you, that's one of the best ways you can know that you belong to Him. Even though when you are in sin and being disciplined, you might often feel lost. It's actually one of the greatest indications that you belong to Him. He says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when He rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his child. And so when we are practicing the word, God sends conviction to our heart. And then once we get that conviction, it usually brings about the awareness that leads to confession. You know, I think about Thomas and in John chapter 20 and verse 25, he is told by the other disciples that Jesus has risen from the dead. And he says, I will not believe unless I see the scars in his hands and the piercing in his side. And then you remember less than a week after that, he is with the disciples and they all appear. And when Jesus, I mean, they're there and Jesus suddenly appears. And when he appears, he says, Thomas, come, you know. And Thomas quickly says, my Lord and my God. You know, I think about what confession is. It's when conviction comes, even if it's in a split moment, the moment that he saw the resurrected Christ appear in their midst, he moved directly from conviction to, conv to confession, my Lord and my God. Well, there's a third step when we practice the word. Not only are we convicted when we're outside of it, not only should we confess, like in 1 John 1, 9, confess your sin. He's faithful and just to forgive you your sin and cleanse you. And I want you to listen to all unrighteousness, all unrighteousness. And once he's done that, then his transforming work continues. So conviction, confession, and transformation. Possibly one of the greatest stories and all of the Bible of that is found in Luke 19. And there we find the story of the tax collector Zacchaeus and how he makes a, a strategy to be up in a tree where Jesus is going to pass. And when he gets to the place where Zacchaeus is up in the tree, Jesus looks up and says, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to your house today. And Zacchaeus is totally transformed in that moment. You say, well, Pastor, how do you know that? Because this man, this little short man who was afraid of the crowd, now puts his back to that which could harm him and with boldness states that he has radically been changed. He demonstrates that by what he does. If I've offended anybody, I'll do twice what the law calls for. And Jesus said when he heard Zacchaeus demonstrate his faith, this man too is a child of Abraham. Well, what does that mean? It means that Jesus had listened and received and brought him into the kingdom because in conviction and in confession, transformation had taken place and it demonstrated itself in behavior. Do what the word says. Our third point today has to do with sharing the word. The word that is received becomes a part of us. We practice by allowing the word to live in and through us, and it changes our character as well as our conduct. And now we're talking about sharing the word. Now that's found in James 1, 26 and 27. Now the thing you won't find there is a plan of salvation. The thing you won't find there is a list of the Roman road. But what you will find there is what James believes is the best way for someone to share their faith. Have you ever heard the story, the only Jesus some folks see is you? They see him in and through your life. And that's how the love of Christ is shared. Said. So if we're going to share God's Word, we have to be involved in acting and doing for others. He has said that religion 
pure and undefiled is to help people that are dispossessed, to help people who can't help themselves. Of course, in the first century, the two best examples of that would be orphans who had nowhere to be and no one to be with, no one to look after them, and widows who were just about as bad off as the orphans. In fact, it is often said that for a person who is a widow, she only had two opportunities. One was to beg and one was prostitution. And quite often, both of those became a severe part of that person's life just to survive. And he says, as the Lord's people, we're to take care of folks like that. We are to share the word by what we do and our behavior for others. No greater love, Jesus said, has any man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Those who consider themselves religious, James says, and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves. Our tendency sometimes, instead of doing what needs to be done, is to talk about others and their inadequate way of doing it. You know, it's not that they're doing such a bad job. It's just a way for us to get it off of us and the fact we know we're not doing anything. Have you ever noticed in meetings, I've been a pastor all these years, and most of the time the people who fuss the most at business meetings are the ones doing the, le the least. I remember one night we had a major uh, discussion over finances, and uh, we found out shortly after that meeting that the person who was so upset with the finances of the church, you guessed it, they weren't giving one cent to the church. Isn't it amazing how we as people act? And yet Jesus has called on us to do to others as we would have them do unto us. And we call that the golden rule. And so it's a part of what is called for by the perfect law, as we looked at earlier. That perfect law is in the Ten Commandments. That perfect law is in the life and the ministry of Jesus. That perfect law is found in what is, what is required of believers and the Lord's church. And that perfect law is also there when God reaches out and he's no respecter of persons and anyone who put their faith and trust in him can be forgiven of sin and come to Christ for salvation. So, we not only want to do for others, we want to demonstrate before others that kind of doing. I was raised in Birmingham, Alabama, and one of the local tourist sites that we had was a statue called Vulcan. And Vulcan was given to us by uh, the country of Italy, and it laid for years out at the state fairgrounds until they finally decided to make it a monument to the steel business that was there. And U.S. Steel was a major employer as I was growing up. In fact, it was the major employer in all of Birmingham. And they took this huge statue of a, a person who worked with iron and put it up on the top of Red Mountain. And I loved to go up there. It had all kinds of things that were fun for kids. And then one day I kind of ventured off and went in behind because I kind of want to see all of the statue. And, and I got behind the guy to look to see what was back behind him. And I looked down on the ground and there's this statue uh, of a man who's on his knees. And I thought, well, that's odd. And I, w I walked down and I began to read the, the plaque. And the plaque just said, Religion in shoes. It was about Brother Brian, a man who was a pastor who loved the poor people that lived in the inner city of Birmingham and it was his call in life to minister to them. In fact, there was a story I already knew of, of the fact that he had found a man in the coldest part of our winter there and he literally took off his own coat and he gave it to the homeless man so that he would not freeze. Religion in shoes. He loved them. He fed them. He eventually developed a way to house them and we had one of the first great in-town ministries for the homeless called the Jimmy Hell Mission. And I'll never forget that, but when I remember Brother Brian, I think of a person who demonstrates doing 
their faith. A call to listen and to act. There was a day in Brother Brian's life when he heard Jesus call upon him to come for salvation. There was a day in his life when because he was intently listening to the Word of God, the Word of God that had saved him, the Word of God that was being practiced and working within him, and now the Word of God that he was seeking to share, it called him to be a pastor. But not any pastor, but a pastor to those folks that were homeless and most of them jobless on the inner city of Birmingham. And then finally, it was a call for him to go out and live his faith. And even though his salary was meager, he didn't hesitate to take off his own coat and give it to a person in need. Now, I see that as fairly significant because it demonstrates two things. It demonstrates great benevolence and generosity. A love for people who are without. But you know, it demonstrates something else. You might say, well, Pastor, how in the world could I be like Brother Brian? How in the world could I live like our Lord lived and die with just the clothes on your back? How, how could you be that giving? How could you do the life of Christian living in the ways that even some of these examples today in the lesson have described? There was a last thing you see in Brother Brian. It, it wasn't just his generosity and his care. It was his absolute belief that God would take care of him. Did you know that? God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. Songwriter wrote those words. Sometimes it's hard for me to believe, brothers and sisters, that God's going to take care of me. I get scared about what's going on in the world around us. What's going to happen to our uh, rule of order? What's going to happen to our economic situation? What's going to happen to the, the monies that are being set aside to do all the different things that are purposed in life for us? And what would I do if all of that all of a sudden was gone? Well, I would call you and I to go back to this passage where we're called to listen. And we need to listen to God a little closer. And then we need to get up and go out after we've listened and we need to act like we believe in a God who not only loves the dispossess, but loves us and will meet our every need. I trust this week you will put your faith and trust in God first for salvation, then for the truth that will help you to practice what His Word teaches and have a life that when others see you becomes a true sharing of pure religion. God bless you. A great theologian once said, God gave us two ears and one mouth. And James certainly seeks to get us to listen more than we speak. But that listening is a listening that's more than just audio. It's to listen to the depths of your heart, to the truths of God's Word. I pray as His Word spoke to you today through the Scripture and through the message that you are seriously considering what the Holy Spirit would have you do. If you're a person that does not know Christ, I pray that you would ask Him to be your Lord and Savior. You do that by confessing that you're a sinner, asking Him to forgive you of your sin, Believe that he lived, died, and rose again. And then ask him to come in and live in your heart. And he promises, if you'll call upon him in such a way, he will save you. And for those of us who know the Lord, but we've not really been living a life that shows that we know the Lord, that he would bring us discipline and rebuke and help us to live in such a way that others would truly see Jesus in us. Would you pray with me? Father, I ask today that we would listen and listen in such a way that we would act. We would act out of sinfulness 
towards salvation for you, from you. As we pray and ask that you come into our heart and save us, as we pray and ask as saved people that you would forgive us of our sinning and make us righteous again by the blood of Christ. We thank you that we can bring this prayer to you today and know that you hear and that you answer. And we pray it in and through the name of Jesus, the Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for being a part of our worship here today at the Church at the Beach. God bless. Thank you.